All right, well, um, I want to thank you all for joining us today um, uh, for this panel, the reemergence of venture-backed hard tech. Uh, this is a, an area that's very near and dear to my heart as something that we've been looking at solving, and we brought together an amazing panel to uh, provide their insights on these emerging opportunities here. Um, funding gap is real in hard tech. It's 15 to 1 for every uh, for early stage company as it gets down to 10 to 1 uh, from a dollar perspective. Um, and there's so much opportunity, so much activity going on in our, uh, in our entrepreneurial centers, our research labs and universities. And it's amazing to see uh, the industry and the venture community start coming behind us. Uh, leading the panel today is going to be Pete Wilkins. Um, he's a leader of Hyde Park Angels, Ch uh, Chicago's most active investor, and a true partner in, in helping us, M-Hub, build out um, our product impact fund and, and really start solving this early stage gap. Um, again, I want to thank you all today for joining M-Hub and uh, this panel, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Pete, to get started. Hey, hey, man, I appreciate it, but one quick thing, who's bringing us our program today? Oh, yes, uh, bringing us our program today is uh, our great spa, uh, partner, uh, Bank of America. Um, you know, as you all know, this this panel was actually scheduled as part of our demo day back in March of uh, March 19, 2020, but, you know, we tried to wait it out uh, for about six months, um, see if we could bring everybody together. But that doesn't look possible for at least the next six months. So, um, you know, appreciate you all coming to, together to do this. But yes, thank you, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know it's important because I think we can fully appreciate taking a stake in our community and helping UbHub survive through this is every dollar counts. And I know that Bank of America has been close to your by your side to make that happen. So I wanted to give them some kudos. Um, so pre no, no problem. So, hey, I'm Pete Wilkins. I'm super excited to have this panel today. Um, the great thing about being the moderator is none of my flaws will be exposed. I just make sure all these geniuses have an opportunity to kind of give you some insights that will help you take a closer look and why is it now the time to build a, a hard tech startup as well as why is now the time to invest in one. So what we're going to do is we're going to have each panelist um, provide a little background who kind of gives them the opportunity to give some insights about them and help you kind of orient what you'll hear from them today. So Sona, so I'd like to start with you um, and then we're going to head over to Ginger and then Beckett, um, you'll be last but not least um, in the intros. Great, thanks very much. Hi everyone, I'm Sona Shah and I'm CEO and co-founder of Neopenda. We innovate uh, needs-based medical technologies, particularly for high growth emerging markets. Um, so very excited to share some insights on the entrepreneurial journey of having a hardware startup, um, particularly in the COVID area where all sorts of new challenges have been thrown at supply chains and hardware um, that have also highlighted the importance of uh, hard tech even more. So I'll leave it at that for now and turn it over to Ginger. Great, thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Ginger Rothrock. I'm grateful to be here, even if virtual. I'm an investor with HG Ventures, which is the corporate venture arm of the Heritage Group out of Indianapolis. Uh, you may not have heard of us. We have 42 operating companies uh, in the industrial sector. Uh, I work with companies in chemicals, environmental, transportation, pretty much anywhere you need a hard hat and steel toed boots. Um, I myself, I'm a chemist and entrepreneur. Uh, on the fund side, um, we started about two years ago. We invest $50 million a year in material science, sustainability, transportation, infrastructure, and areas adjacent to those things you know a lot about. Um, companies at pretty much any stage, Series A to B, are really our sweet spots. We also uh, fund and run a hard tech tech stars accelerator to work with the early stage of the company. Awesome. Beckett? Great. Hey, everybody. Thanks Thanks for the invite. Um, really, really pleased to be here with M-Hub. Um, uh, just a quick background on me. So I'm um, investing director with Boeing Horizon X Adventure, uh, Horizon X Ventures. So that's Boeing's uh, corporate venture capital group. And, um, you know, we invest a across a broad range of, uh, of areas. We've been around for about four years, um, invested in about 35 companies. And I'd say predominantly we've actually invested in, in hard tech. Um, the areas we focus on are the future of mobility. Uh, space and connectivity and industry 4.0. So 
So um, that just gives you sort of the breadth of different things that we see when we look to invest. Um, and I'm happy to share uh, any insights and looking forward to the discussion today. Back to you, Pete. Awesome. Well, Ginger, I didn't even know that you were, did I hear you right? You're a, you, you're a trained chemist, was that correct? I am. Wow, we got wonderful entrepreneur, somebody that's investing in how to get us into space and a chemist all coming together. It's gonna to be a fantastic panel for sure. Um, so that kind of goes to my original point. Clearly, I am uh, surrounded by some really intelligent, bright-minded, and future thinkers around this hard tech um, ecosystem that we're all building. So speaking of ecosystems, typically what we spend time in is talking about the desired outcome. Where do we get at the end of the road we'll be trying to build? And so what I thought, we're going to do something a little bit different. Usually there's a lightning round at the end. Um, but we're going to shake it up just a little bit, which will give everybody kind of get some insights to our viewers of how you think of success in this hard tech space. And so I want to make sure no pressure on you. Um, but the, the question is going to be, which is often my friends will come kind of, kind of determine who is the best NBA players ever, who would be on the Mount Rushmore of NBA. And I know that it kind of takes it out of the sports and we're going to bring it to hard tech. So what I'm going to do is, Sona, I'm going to ask you if you could pick, and it doesn't have to be four, but if you were to pick those individuals that you would put on the hard tech Mount Rushmore, who would you, who would you add to that impressive list of characters and why? Good question. Um, so there's a lot of people that I would add, but um, not a particular person, um, but the the forefathers and mothers of um, frugal innovation. I think that's who I'd put on Mount Rushmore. Um, there's a lot of advances in hardware, uh, but I think it's really important to be able to design specifically with and for users and design um, at a cost that's affordable. So that's core to our mission at Neopenda. So whoever invented that, I, I would put them. All right. Awesome. And just to make sure that I get this right, the you feel, and I didn't hear it clearly just because of the Zoom functionality, who the advancement that they brought, once again, was what? Just to make sure I am crystal clear on that. Yeah, so um, the, the innovators of Frugal, or the founders of Frugal Innovation, um, so taking hardware technology and uh, reimagining it, redesigning it for constraints of every environment, um, including low resource setting. Oh, all right, well, uh, definitely worthy. Um, and we'll do some research on the back end and we'll put some names to those folks in the future. I'll, I'll, I'll delegate that to Haven. Um, hopefully he'll be able to get that in real time during the show, kind of like on the back end. All right, so that is a great start. Ginger, um, from your perspective, who would you be etching in stone of the hard tech Mount Rushmore? Well, I like to think about taking it back to uh, Henry Ford with mass production and completely changing the way that we build things. Um, Andrew Carnegie, uh, who I love because of the efficiencies with steel, but also because he gave his fortune away um, at the end. And uh, maybe I'll add a lady in there, uh, Grace Hopper, with uh, the advent of computer software converting uh, into machine language. Uh, and I like it. We're building, we got four now, um, for sure. So we're kind of combining, which is awesome. And we'll maybe we'll make like six people. We have that kind of luxury. But I think that when you think of like some of the people that created innovation and where it wasn't, and how that's changed our world, those are impressive names. And I think that that is something that we're seeing going on right now. Um, and we could talk a little bit, I know we'll get into the conversation, is just look at how quickly the hard tech communi community responded in the current pandemic and how many ways we can solve problems that we could never solve before because we're driving this innovation and really in a very efficient way that Sona kind of commented to. So awesome, that's a great start. Um, Beckett, you're on the hot seat. Um, you're, you, we need to get your inspirational leaders that might make it to a mountain etched in stone. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I was thinking about this and a saying came to mind, which is, um, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. So I think if you're thinking consumer versus medical versus industrial, you're going to have a different answer. But, you know, I sit in Boeing and think about aerospace all day. So 
for me, it's going to be sort of jaded with that lens. But I think you sort of have to go with with um, Elon Musk and, and SpaceX as, as one of them because, you know, space is a really unforgiving environment, highly regulated industry. Um, you know, and he basically was going up against a monopoly back in the 2000s and um, against a lot of headwinds, succeeded with some very, very hard technology. And now he's sort of built towards this vision of going to Mars but in the meantime has created, you know, affordable space access and been able to um, really build this, this, you know, really interesting new network that can help get people connected around the world through his Starlink constellation. So um, it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, capability that he's developed there. So I, I definitely put him on the list. And then just as I was thinking about it, the other one I'd, I'd say is, is a good one is, is just James Dyson. I mean, he's he just an inventor, a tinkerer, someone who's really focused on just making the absolute best product um, and, and toiling the way to make sure, sure it gets there and, and going through a lot of adversity. So those are my two. Awesome. That's great. Uh, great answers by the, the, the crew um, put on the hot seat. But I think it, I think the one thing that we can capture for sure, and it probably will translate through the whole panel is those folks are all big, big visionaries like to believe something that is impossible can be possible. And I also love the element of the practical side that all of you guys took from like an engineering perspective. How do we create efficiency in the process with the resources we have? And I think that you know now more than ever, um, with all the different technologies that are being brought to bear, there is even more innovation than we've ever seen. And I think that if I parallel it to kind of tech investments, or even like some of the go-to-market CPG products is we're now in the place where we can kind of do it by the drink, meaning that we don't have to build out a full factory to actually produce the same things we used to do. We can do that in, in the moment with the resources we have at scale and then validate those models. So I think that there's big visions ahead, but probably more capacity to really validate technology. And I would just say that themes it all together because when you can actually bring a product to market and have it validated, which has traditionally been tough in hard tech because you had to do so much, it makes it easier to invest from an early stage perspective because it allows you to invest in a smaller element, show that there's some market traction and then continue to scale. So you guys hit on kind of like the core of the whole time. Why now is the time for investing in venture backed hard tech? I believe that's the right title. So. Let's continue that. Um, so Anna, you kind of, uh, and your frame of reference as being a bootstrapping entrepreneur trying to figure out, and I guess, you know, um, looking at how do I use the resources that I have that are typically constrained, how do I bring a product to market? And if you could kind of say, you know, you know what do you have to believe now? If I'm sitting in the audience and maybe I'm building out a model or I'm thinking about going to market, what do I have to believe now it's time to do it from a hard tech perspective. Yeah, so there's um, a couple of, a lot of things that we've learned along the way. Um, we started Neopendo about five years ago and our first product is a wearable vital signs monitor for neonates. So um, a lot of the core of why we started Neopendo was to translate um, known and proven science, known and proven medical devices that exist in uh, you know, high income countries and just translate it to lower resource settings where 85% of the world's population lives. Um, so uh, one of the lessons that we learned very early on was the importance of user centric design and involving users every step of the way. Um, you know, the hardware is a little bit tougher than software in that um, you can't necessarily iterate on it so many times once it's in the market. Um, it just requires, you know, larger supply chains, manufacturing lines, things that are more difficult and complex. So you have to get it right up front, um, and that takes a bit more time. Uh, but really investing your time in talking to your users and um, the people that are actually um, that will be purchasing your product, but also using the product. I think it's very important to get their voice um, and lessons learned. So that's one of the biggest things that we did. Um, I think the the practicality and the efficiency that you had mentioned is also really important. What we're seeing in hard tech is that sensors, technology, hard hardware is becoming more and more efficient, um, is becoming more and more cost effective. So how do we leverage all of the these technologies in, in a way that we can harness data, that we can harness a lot of things that can be captured by software? 
but are only enabled by hardware itself. Um, so uh, there's a lot of a lot of reasons why now is so crucial, and I think we've seen that with COVID. Um, just the amount of hardware that is necessary at this stage, um, it's just highlighted the need even more and more, but I think that need is going to only continue to grow. So lots of lessons learned, um, but uh, again, I think the focus on user-centric design and making sure you understand the actual requirements for your users is really important. Can I, can I double click on one point that I think is important? Because you don't have the same capacity that software has to iterate. Yeah. And you know, like it's, you know, you hear software evangelists say just push it out and see how people use it i mean like and that you can't do that but when you're looking at prototyping typing your product you know what efficiencies like what do you do to kind of get that prototype to test that user reaction and then the second question is how do you know it's ready to go get some actual market feedback yeah, great questions. Um, so I, I think with prototypes, there are lots of ways that you can innovate very cost effectively and very rapidly. Um, rapid prototyping is so crucial. And it could be anything as, you know, creating something out of toilet paper and then handing it to your users as long as it's a mock-up or some kind of representation. And then get feedback from your users and they'll tell you, oh, toilet paper's too thin. And um, then you go back and come back with a thicker material or whatever the feedback is, you iteratively design it um, or you iteratively pour that into the design. So it is still an iterative process. It's just on the upfront side, which I actually think is a huge advantage of hardware because once you have that design locked in, you're not really iterating on it too many times. Um, it's not like software where people are gonna give you tons and tons of feedback um, on a minute by minute basis and you have to iterate on that. Um, it's much more or less locked in um, until you have another big design iteration. Do you, do you think there's like a tipping point where you finally got enough feedback from the toilet paper, which then went to a fabric to like, what is your go, no go decision? Or, I mean, it's probably hard to say it's gonna be different, but is there something in your mind like that you have a level of validation that it's ready to take it to market? Yeah, so I think it uh, somewhat depends on the industry. Um, we are with medical devices that are a highly regulated industry. So there are certain standards that require you to have a certain level of safety, accuracy, performance, et cetera. Um, so that's a lot of what we fall back on, um, but I think a lot of it goes back to risk, and this is true for any industry. You have to understand what the risk of your product is, um, the risk of failure, the risk of um, in our case, you know, harm to patient, um, what could be that resulting risk? And depending on that risk profile, um, you can kind of iterate uh, and get comfortable with the level. Um, so if it's a high risk and, you know, the device has potential to burn a patient, that's high risk, um, that's an issue. And so we have to get a lot more feedback on those areas um, than something where, you know, aesthetic, what color do you want it to be? Um, so it really depends on the, the requirement from the user and the requirement from the design. Um, but for us, it's largely based on risk. Yeah, all right, well, that, that's, that, that really kind of provides a good framework to think about. And I think that, Ginger, from a, an investor perspective, mm -hmm. you know, you get a lot of different opportunities to invest at different times. And so, you know, there's a number of folks that will come to you and say, I have this prototype and I'm confident that I can actually go to market with it. Or you might see a product in market and you're trying to determine if it's actually has scale from a mass perspective. So maybe it's like going to be a two level question, but what do you have to believe to um, seed an investment and maybe do a meaningful investment from a follow on? Is mm -hmm. that a, that frame it up fairly? Sure. Yeah, Mark? that sounds great. Um, I mean, certainly the business we're in and uh, is, is people, right? Um, so for us or for me personally, and this is different investor to investor, um, in the hard tech space, hard tech's hard, right? So I'm looking for a founder or team or leader leaders that really are have a relentless pursuit for success, right? And, and this is not saying they have a deep commitment to their solution because so many times, as Sona said, like you go in, you prototype, and you have to change things. And I've seen a lot of um, hard tech innovators get all wrapped up in their solutions being the right thing. So it's really about like wanting to find a way to succeed, right? Um, and the self-awareness that comes with the ability to know when you're potentially wrong. Um, it also comes with storytelling. Um, having this sort of kind of where you have a vision 
and you can articulate this end, end game and the way that you're going to change the world, but at the same time, be very obsessive about the progress you have every day because, again, like, like Sona said, you have to get it right up front. You don't have a lot of choices once you go into manufacturing. Um, on the market side, certainly, I'm interested in why is somebody in this market? You know, what do you know that others don't? Uh, we are a strategic investor, so I'm always thinking about how could we at the Heritage Group really amplify what you're doing? Um, going to the risk topic, I'm interested in market risk. Most of the things we do are B2B. A lot of a lot of the hard tech sector is B2B. And does someone have a clear understanding of that path and time to market? What is the length of time before a buying decision? I mean, if you're Boeing, life is very different than if you're, you know, making a shampoo ingredient or whatnot. And the last one is technology, which I think um, Sona highlighted pretty well. What's the secret sauce? I will highlight that IP is exceptionally important here. And I say IP generally, um, as covering all categories, including patents. Because uh, there are a lot of companies, um, both inside and out the U.S., that could throw 50 engineers on something. The speed is just not enough in this market. Um, and we want to validate things in our own labs. I said, I'm a chemist. Uh, we have a R and D group. So when we have a hard tech we're looking at, like we will bring it in and we will test it, and that makes it really fun. So we love to analyze that. So I'll How, there. when you look at yeah, when you look at it, like do you guys invest? in prototypes or does it have to be in market and validated like where do you guys Ooh, sit? not right. at all no i we do, we do the full spectrum i mean we have some companies that are selling now but i think um what do we have 14 companies in our portfolio 12 of them are pre-product pre-revenue and and when you're looking at that because the entrepreneurs I, I guarantee a lot of viewers in the audience have ideas mm -hmm. some of them probably already have kind of a prototype that they're sharing with their friends and people that are familiar with like how much like from an investment perspective yeah. how do you kind of calibrate like how much you're willing to invest at different stages and I know different traction but in general yeah um, somebody that has a sort of a working prototype and some semblance of an idea I mean we'll call that kind of a seed investment right somewhere in the category of one to three million it's a little bit more than what you might need for software um, and once they have uh, line aside and they're ready to scale. They've got, you know, they're making their product, whatever it might be, whether it's a chemical or a piece of hardware, um, they're making it on a, using a process that will easily scale. That's probably time for like a series A round, which varies from us between anywhere from four to $12 million. And then from there, it's all over the board, of course. And when you see just in the series A, and this will be the last question on investing um, <laughs> with this is, when that series A, they're probably in market with a product though, right? There's probably, no? Nope. No, still... no, a lot of times they're actually trying to scale from like a pilot scale to a more of a commercial scale. And that's when you're gonna have your real contracts, right? Maybe you're doing some testing with customers um, using pilot manufacturing, uh, but you really need that A round to build the, or toll out, or if your software, you know, scale up that technology to sort of the end commercialization like so i will say yeah. yeah i mean for sure so if, for those that are familiar with software investing it you're right. getting further down the line yeah, and you guys are stepping in early on which makes sense because you need the to. capital to do some more so that, that's mm -hmm. awesome Becky, switching over to you, I mean, Boeing, um, you know, clearly has a lot of dough, can do a lot of different things. Um, why not just build it all, um, get a bunch of smart people, figure it out, and invest in them? Why invest in the market? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think it's, you know, that there are many different sort of angles you can take at this answer. I think, you know, at the company level, Boeing is, you know, fundamentally, we are good at building hard tech, but a lot of it is, you know, about integration. So it's about integration of many different, you know, hard technologies that ultimately gets people and goods from point A to point B. Um, and, and, you know, that's what we are. We're, you know, the country's largest exporter of, of hard tech, right? Um, but, you know, I think what we've recognized over the past, you know, 20 years, I think what you saw in companies like Boeing, like GE, like GM, was sort of historically like a more of a siloed, you know, internal research and development approach. And that, I think that worked a lot back then because there was a lot of, you know, government funding and, um, the tech giants weren't here, and there's just a lot of um, rationale to sort of keep a lot of things sort of close hold internally. Now, what we're seeing is, you know, number one, the degree of um, 
of different technologies on our platforms has, has really shifted. There's a lot more, you know, software, sensors, other things that make up a big piece of the value of the aircraft and other products we develop. So that's one. Um, two, we're seeing a lot of both small and large companies come to an, into our market spaces. And it's sort of this convergence of industries where you're seeing, you know, tech and software, you're seeing the autos start to look at how do we transport people by flying. There's a lot of sort of this emerging convergence happening. Um, and, and so w what you get is you get a, a ton of, number one, you get investing, you know, capital that's coming from outside sources that's putting resource into all this hard tech. Um, which you can then leverage to then apply to aerospace, which is phenomenal. And two, I just think there's just so much, there's so many different pockets of expertise in this that, you know, uh, even a big company like Boeing can't have, ex, you know, the, the best experts in every different function. And so, you know, the reason we sort of exist is really to, to help dig into that external innovation and create meaningful partnerships that help, you know, us you know, on the side of our core business, but also, you know, is mutually beneficial to the portfolio companies um, that, that we partner with. So, so that's really, I think, you, you know, the big rationale for us in terms of why we spend so much time thinking about um, external innovation. That's fair. And so maybe, um, it's like Ginger was giving us some insights. It's always great to get insights on what you look for and when you invest, because I think that as an entrepreneur, that is, the, there are so many questions because they've never been through it before and it's a lot of hearsay. So hearing from you kind of what you're looking for and, and maybe even like the criteria that you're looking for to invest would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so yeah, let me, let me just first say a few things um, based on what Ginger said. So first of all, I, I totally agree with everything Ginger said about team. Team is so important. You have to have a really good team because especially in hardware, you're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to dig into different people's capabilities as you, you know, cobble together your prototype and bring it to investors. So I think team is, is hugely important. At, at Horizon X Ventures, we're, we're really sort of that blend of strategic and financial. So when we evaluate an opportunity, it's, uh, you know, first and foremost, does this meet some of the critical criteria that you'd see uh, if you were a typical financial VC. So, you know, and, and that's really the three things that I think we sort of all know, which is, you know, is, is the market big enough to build a big company? Um, is your product the right product for the market? And depending on whatever that is and the user's needs. Um, and then, you know, what's, is this the best team to go and execute on this opportunity? So that's sort of the, the first lens. And then the second lens is how is this, you know, number one, relevant to aerospace and our own internal sort of thinking about this technology area and where it's going. Um, and two, how, how does this, um, you know, how could we actually add value? Because if we're, you know, if we're an investor, we want to add value to, to the startup and to Boeing. And so is there a way to create a meaningful commercial relationship, a partnership, some sort of, you know, other transaction that helps us bring this capability, whether it's driving new revenue streams, differentiating our products, whatever it is. So that's kind of the, the criteria we, we really look at when we, when we evaluate opportunities. And we're sort of in the same area as, as Ginger. We, you know, we'll go early, we will do some seed investing. Actually, we even um, did a very, you know, a accelerator program in the UK uh, that's, that's really based on sort of industry 4.0, and that's really, you know, more of seed stage. Um, but I'd say the sweet spot again is really in that series A where, you know, the, the product and the idea and the team are sort of fleshed out and they're starting to get that product market fit going and it's time to start thinking about how to scale the business. So, so that's kind of our criteria. All right. Let me, let me, you, you touched on something that probably both you and Ginger can speak to. So now I'm sure you have a perspective as well, but as a quote unquote strategic investor, you have an element where value is being created. I mean, this is going to be a two part, but I'll just start with the first one is when you see commercial value, is that done in parallel with your investment or is it done separately? Or what is the mechanics of looking at that? And for the viewers out there, what I mean by commercial is so there's a business owner that has a business application for your product and they are going to conduct business with you. And then the venture arm will say, I will invest in your business. And 
Sometimes they run parallel, sometimes they're um, linear. So I frame that up, um, Becca, it would be great to get your perspective. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the answer is, is, is kind of both. I mean, I'd say predominantly we're out to look for, you know, companies that we think can really differentiate, um, you know, in, in terms of how we bring them together into our, into our products, help us build new business lines. And I'd say, you know, probably more frequently, it's us being in the ecosystem, meeting with folks and understanding the opportunity and then vetting it internally. And when we invest, there doesn't have to be a commercial relationship. Um, in fact, we think a lot of the value add is that we have another, you know, sister organization called Portfolio Development, whose basically job is to be the concierge service into Boeing and help drive those commercial partnerships with the business units. Um, that said, when we, when, if there's something that's already ready made and it's clear that there's, you know, value that can be created um, at the same time as the investment, we'll do that. But we still, when we invest, we still like to invest on, you know, pretty plain vanilla investment terms mm -hmm. and let the, you know, let the partner work the commercial angle directly with the business unit. We can be sort of the grease, you know, that helps, you know, we, you know, get in the gears, but, um, but we, we kind of prefer to keep them separate. That's it in terms of, you mentioned mechanisms. So one mechanism we do use is if we see a good opportunity that can be kind of a catalyst, sometimes we'll invest an amount and we'll sort of cordon off a small bit that we use as, as directed funding. And that's basically part of the investment is used to help facilitate the relationship with the commercial group. The commercial group invests a little bit and that's how you sort of get the POC and start getting, you know, being the catalyst for driving that commercial activity. Awesome. I don't know, Ginger, did you want to add anything or did that um, in align with? Yeah, I would just, I would just say for us, um, we operate completely independent of our business units. That's not actually, for those of us in the audience, those in the audience, you should be aware of if you do work with the CVC, do they need this business unit sign off or not? Um, that's an important thing for us. We act very independent, which allows us to move a lot faster. Um, no commercial relationships required in any of our term sheets. Um, and then of course we will make introductions and once they're in our portfolio we put everything we can to help our portfolio companies um, have us as a customer or have other ways that they could use us awesome so thona i'm going to pivot back to the entrepreneur we've heard a lot from the investors and you know it's good this is going to be twofold i think that probably many people um have heard your story but probably not a lot that are actually on the um webinar today so if you could tell us a little bit about your journey, and then the second question that I'm gonna ask is, now that the world is gonna be new, different, I guess that every, it's always new, but it'll be different. Like if you were an entrepreneur and you were able to just start all over again with you seeing an opportunity emerge, where would you focus on? And I know you're gonna be tied to that, but maybe tell us about your journey and then what you're seeing in the overall landscape that you think is attractive. Yeah, um, great question. So for my journey, I started out um, doing chemical engineering uh, at Georgia Tech, graduated a semester early and thought, why not um, travel a bit before starting to work? So um, I ended up in Western Kenya as a primary school teacher. So nothing to do with my engineering background, but um, wanted to get away and do something different. So I was there for several months and just absolutely loved the culture and the community. Um, it's just uh, it's amazing how little they can live off of and how happy they are um, without kind of a lot of the expectations. But of course, being there for several months, um, I did witness a lot of inequities, some in the healthcare sector, but kind of across the board. Um, and that certainly stuck with me for a bit. Um, so I had a job lined up at a pharma company. So I came back to the US and started working in pharma. Um, I was doing research and development, um, bioprocess research and developments, working with these awesome bioreactors in the fun transition between lab to manufacturing scale. The drugs that we were helping create were being used in clinical trials. Um, so I got to see a lot of different medications go through the pipeline. Um, and I think there was one distinct point um, where I saw a filter and the filter was a thousand dollars and it was a single use filter. And I remember thinking I could have bought my kids so many more books with this one filter. Um, and the 
Uh, and then on top of that, I realized that my kids in Kenya actually would never see the medications that I was helping make. Um, and so the inequity started to eat away at me enough that I decided to go to graduate school um, for my master's in biomedical engineering, wanted to shift a little bit to focus on medical devices and providing more equitable access to healthcare around the world. Um, so started at Columbia University, I um, met my now co-founder Tess, and we started exploring why newborn mortality is so much higher in low resource settings than in the US. Um, went to Uganda and did a needs assessment and realized that these hospitals are just so overcrowded. Um, nurses don't have the capacity to uh, identify when a patient was actually in distress. And so newborns would end up dying from preventable causes. And part of the reason was because there was no equipment in the ward. Um, it was actually in a room that nurses call the equipment graveyard, and it's where all the broken medical equipment would go because even if it functions extraordinarily well here in the U.S., it, when donated, it ends up um, failing very quickly because it doesn't take into consideration power instability, wireless connectivity, all sorts of issues. And that was something that we saw in 85% of the world's population. So we decided to create Neopenda to focus on designing and implementing medical technologies that are designed for um, a large market and to do so in a way that improves quality of care around the world. So that's um, my story. Sorry, that was oh, that's a an impressive than story. <laughs> that was good. Almost brings a tear to my eye too. Very, <laughs> very powerful. <laughs> I feel like I can't um, talk much about what we do without showing you Natasha. This is Natasha in our wearable vital signs monitor. So um, just to show you that we bring hardware into a lot of what we do. Um, and certainly have a lot of lessons kind of around that. Um, you know, your second question around opportunities emerging, um, I actually wouldn't change anything about what we did. I, I certainly would um, undo a lot of the mistakes that we made early on and understanding, you know, that um, just doing things a little bit more efficiently the first time around. But, you know, especially with COVID, I think that the need for a product like ours has been highlighted even more so than it was previously. So, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, I love the healthcare sector um, as regulated and as complex as it, as it is. I think there's just so much opportunity um, to have hardware that actually helps patients. Um, and I wouldn't change, you know, the first product because um, even something like a vital signs monitor is very relevant in COVID and, um, and beyond. So there's longevity in what we're doing as well. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't change much around the opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, well, clearly not. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'd ask you is what do you think of the investing landscape in front of you? Like, do you think, do you think it's opening up, contracting? What's your perspective? So a little bit of both. Um, I think uh, being in a highly regulated industry, there are a lot of investors that don't always understand the medical device or the healthcare sector. So even if they um, do invest in hardware, there's an added complexity. And you know, the good thing is that my team has incredible expertise in that now. So we, we know how to design and implement medical technologies where we look to our investors is more, how do we scale? How do we build um, a more robust supply chain to help meet the demand that we're seeing? So. Um, um, it really depends on kind of the investor relationship and who we're targeting, but it does open up a, a wide variety of investors that we can go to. Um, we can go to the med device, we can go to hardware, we can go to emerging market focus. Um, there's a lot of different investors that we like to bring together um, to really enhance and strengthen kind of the effort that we're doing. Um, I will also just mention that I think COVID has shifted the conversation quite a bit with the investment space. Um, so. Uh, a lot of investors are focusing on their portfolio companies instead of making new investments. I think we're starting to see, um, I'm curious to hear, you know, Beckett and Ginger, if that's kind of um, a lot of what has gone through your mind, um, but we are seeing investors starting to emerge and starting to reinvest in, in newer startups as well. So um, I'm ho hopeful that that shift will continue forward. Um, but I think COVID has definitely changed the equation both on the entrepreneurial side and the investor side. Well, that's excellent. So why don't we do this? Because I know that we're going to roll into questions um, in about three minutes. And so what I'm going to do for Ginger, Ginger and Beckett, um, someone opposed the question. I like it. Thanks for helping me out here with the panel moderation. I need it whenever <laughs> I can get it. Um, but I guess from your perspectives, Ginger and Beckett, um, what what is your view as far as investing? Are you guys, you know, pedal to the metal, we're kind of keeping it at 55, um, or do you got it in neutral and waiting for the market to kind of situate itself? From our perspective, we 
I think we slowed down when March hit because um, there was a lot of uncertainty there. And because as a strategic, we're investing off the balance sheet and it was unclear where that was going to be. We still made a announced a seven and a half million dollar investment in a company in the additive manufacturing space. We actually ended up helping out a couple of our companies that were in our tech stars cohort before with smaller investments than we traditionally make because they needed to close around. So we actually kind of changed. We have our usual scope and we stick to it, but we were a lot more flexible to help out um, companies that weren't technically in our portfolio, but were related to us through Techstars. Um, and we're back in action now. Um, I think our focus has changed some. Um, I saw a question in the comments about, you know, what has happened and how has the industrial world changed? And and we've kind of, and we've refocused and interested in, in trends that are coming out like um, supply chain nationalization like decentralization of like energy to combat grid issues that we're seeing places, decentralization of manufacturing. Um, we're seeing more and more traditional software firms moving into industrial tech to solve supply chain. And I, I think in automation, robots and whatnot. So I think we're actually paying attention to those trends and really actively looking for things in those sectors that we would not have in the past. Uh, that, that, that's great insights. Um, Becca, anything to share? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, our experience is pretty similar to what Ginger said. I think people wanted to, you know, focus on helping their current investments or when everything hit. Um, you know, we, we've made, you know, a few follow on investments since COVID. And I think now it's we're starting to sort of emerge and people are starting to, you know, think about what's what's new again. Um, I, I agree a lot with actually what she said around some some of the shifts in focus. Um, especially in aerospace, there's just a lot of, especially with, you know, some of the climate events happening around, there's a lot more focus on sustainability. And aerospace is a tough one because, you know, it is, is a big user um, of, you know, carbon, carbon based fuel. And so we need to find other ways to reduce emissions. Um, and a lot of people in, in Europe, especially, are really focused on, on creating caps on, on how much um, how much emissions occur, and so sustainability is an area we're thinking um, we're, we're thinking about more. So that, that's one. And then um, you know, one one thing I'd just say that's kind of useful. I think if if people are out there and feeling like, man, I, I don't think any VCs are investing. Um, there's something going around that that I think is is helpful, and and I don't know who said it originally, but um, you know, if you did a study in 2009 of the S&P 500. Um, you'd find that, you know, roughly 40, 50 percent of those companies were actually started during a period of recession. And, uh, you know, the smart investors get that and know that, like, now is actually a great time to be investing. You know, norms are changing. People are moving around. Um, there's just a lot of sort of newness that happens out of the out of some of the chaos. And I think um, the, the bold investors recognize that and, and will we'll definitely be funding great ideas and great teams. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think, you know, and what I'll do is, um, panelists, I have one question that I'm going to hold depending on our Q&A um, allotment of time, because I want to make sure we open that up. So that's a teaser. I got a filler in case the Q&A doesn't come in like I think it will. Um, but I will say one of the things that HPA has learned, like we've invested in New Current, um, Hologram, Nanograph, and just over the evolution over the last six years or so, um, the capital that's coming into the market. But I think one of the unique things from an investor perspective is our path to liquidity is a little bit different as well. And so where we see tech and software, our, our biggest drivers of, of enterprise value are staying private longer, where you're seeing a pretty aggressive strategic investment um, or acquisition landscape, which is also good for investors when they're looking at making investments. So I think there's some positive trends from that perspective on a macro perspective. Maybe I could say perspective one more time, but I won't, we'll switch right into um, the Q and A. Um, so this is good. Shan, oh, there you are, awesome. You're on and you'll help us run the Q and A. Um, so I'll hand it over to you uh, to do that. Great, thanks Pete. And thanks panelists, this has been such a great discussion. I've really enjoyed listening. I'm kind of sad it's getting towards the end. So we'll jump right into Q&A and I just want to say thanks for everybody being on. A quick a quick plug, if you've got questions, send them to us in the Q&A function. We'll roll through them with this last 12 minutes of the panel, but if we don't get to your question, never fear. Uh, we will go ahead and answer it over email. You can hit us 
at team at mhubchicago.com. So first question comes to us from Ushma Kriplani. Hi, Ushma, how are you doing? Um, we'll keep it rolling with Beckett here. She says, great comments on space technology investment. Would like to hear you expand on what you think the future is as far as US company growth and supply chains in the field, perhaps part of public-private partnerships like SpaceX. What is the hard tech investor's vision for the industry, say, 10 years out? Wow, that's, yeah, that's a, you know, that's an awesome question. And um, if, if I was good at my job, I would probably, uh, yeah, I'd probably know the, the answer right off the bat. But I think the way to think about it is sort of in, um, in, in different worlds, like, you know, what are the different possibilities? And so, you know, in space, I mean, what you're seeing right now is you're seeing a couple things. You're seeing a lot of companies really targeting this, you know, there's going to be all these sort of reorganization of um, like the traditional space infrastructure. So there'll be low earth orbit satellites, um, a lot more of them as opposed to the big ones that are football field size that are like 26,000 kilometers out from Earth. So um, what that means is there's a lot more opportunity to leverage space. And as the, the access cost of space goes down, the use cases will go up. And so, you know, over the next 10 years, I think there's not going to be, a, I wouldn't say there's going to be like some big dramatic change because things in that industry take a while. But what you will see is you'll see, um, you know, space-based internet. I, I think that certainly will happen. It's already happening now. Um, you'll see definitely a lot more use of um, data analytics and, and imagery from space. You'll see unique, unique ways of um, actually exploring space. Uh, because now you have a lot more assets that you can use in space to be able to actually, you know, look at, um, you know, different different planets and galaxies. And that's actually a real benefit to like NASA and the academic community. And then finally, you'll, what you're going to see is a lot of different business models emerging to your point around supply chain, where you're seeing a lot more verticalization happening, where a lot of the companies that are in this space are actually building internally um, a lot of the capabilities, and that's I think that's good for them controlling what they build. But what what it ha what happens also is you get a lot of redundancy. So you get many different companies building rocket motors when you could probably just have one supplying the industry. And when you look at the history of industries, you see this you know pendulum swing between you know being vertically integrated and outsourcing. And I think at some point in the next ten years, the pendulum's going to swing again, and you're going to get a lot more opportunity for new suppliers in this new space. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, pivoting a little bit from an industry focus, and you touched on this a little bit, Ginger, but I wanna really dig in on the, the US part of this question. Um, from email, the pandemic has really exposed some fault lines in the global supply chain. And for all of you really, are investors looking at hard tech and particularly industrial IoT from a different lens? And is there a renewed focus on strengthening US manufacturing? You're asking me first? Yeah. Yeah, take uh, it away. I mean, absolutely. It's, no doubt. We see it in our own. We were one of the only U.S. producers of isopropyl alcohol. And so we had to find a way to get people in there safely producing things. So um, anything that can be done on the automation side, anything that can be done to simplify the supply chain, um, we're absolutely excited about and think that trend will continue. Um, Donna may have more to add on the IoT side. Chemist, not a software person, but sensors are certainly a huge part of it as well. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that COVID definitely has changed um, the way that you know startups are looking at things um, because, it, of course, supply chains were disrupted. Um, there uh, was an extreme shortage in, in a lot of um, hardware pieces, a lot of technologies, uh, but in our case, our manufacturing is overseas, um, our contract manufacturer. When COVID hit, we did, um, uh, we shifted gears a little bit to come up with what is our plan for a secondary supply chain. That's not something that, you know, a startup at our size would really be thinking about because we don't have capacity. Um, we don't have the funds, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the time. Um, but it's definitely something that we've started building into our plans a lot more is how do we build in a little bit of redundancy so that we know when and where to turn on supply chains um, if something like a pandemic happens again. So I think it definitely has shifted the way that we think about it. Um, 
and it's definitely strengthened, you know, our, our applicability and our relevance. Um, it took a lot of time to figure out how to build a secondary supply chain or how to start thinking about that. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely been highlighted more in our efforts and something that we'll continue to be doing longer term. And, and I'll, I'll add something in a parallel kind of approach, because I think that what what we have seen in investing to a certain degree is software really became highly capital efficient to actually get a market to product or pro um, product to market. And then when we, we have invested in a lot of CPG companies, so Simple Mills, Farmer's Fridge, Factor. And why we see those companies growing is this trend from farm to table really is disrupted what these big companies were doing and they were creating a huge compression of making low cost low nutritionally valued food that the consumer no longer wanted and so when this trend emerged that we want healthy food that is whole produced the supply chain got broken and they are trying to recover that's why it's such an incredible place to invest i believe the same thing for manufacturing is you're having a re-engineering because the we saw the flaws of what was being done and it creates opportunities and i think that it'll allow nimble and innovative entrepreneurs to create in-market solutions that become very powerful and people will invest behind that and that creates customization and customization creates overall mass adoption because behaviors will change and so that's my prediction. Um, do with it what you will, but I think there's a lot of promise to it. <clears throat> Great. Um, another question here in that lens from Dan Radomsky, and hope, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, and Game Recognized Game. He runs a hardware incubator in Michigan, uh, and they have found very new investors willing to invest in hardware or advanced manufacturing technologies unless there is a major software play. The few hardware-focused investors appear to be on the coast, not in the Midwest, um, but the manufacturing and hardware development is here. What is your take on this as investors and startups in this space? I mean, I personally think there's a total mismatch between the number of industrial hard tech customers in the Midwest and the number of startup companies. There's so much opportunity here. Um, I mean, for us, we do both software and hardware. Like my two senior partners are software guys. so. Um, but we're only one. Uh, but I do think there's so much opportunity here. And so I'm super excited about us having a Techstars Accelerator, you guys thinking about, you know, what you're doing at MHub, Accelerator side, um, it's a great opportunity. I would add just one point, which I think to just put in context too, is when you look at early stage investing, 50% of the capital goes into 55% of the deals that are originated in the Valley. And then if you extract and look at what New York, what Chicago, what us and what the Pacific Northwest, I mean, we are, many times people compare the totality of what the Valley does to how efficient we are in the market. There isn't, it's certainly not balanced, but as far as investment in our region, it's actually much stronger than people actually look and understand. So it does, there's a ton more and we should bring more and MHub is critical to that, but it's not as awful as some people would think. I think there's some promising trends to on the horizon. Great. I'll bring in um, an entrepreneurial uh, yeah. voice to this a little bit. So um, I, I actually think that we need more hardware investors in the Midwest. Um, a lot of times when we go out to investors, we do go out to the coast because uh, that's a lot of times where, um, you know, again, I think the medical piece of it adds a layer of complexity into the hardware investors that are in the Midwest um, are focused on different industries. And so um, the more diversity that we can bring to the investment space in the Midwest can certainly augment the types of startups and companies and opportunity that is vastly available um, in this part of the country. So I definitely I, I definitely have seen an increase in number of hardware investments and number of hardware startups, um, but I'd like to see that grow even more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a couple quick rapid fire questions and then Pete, I'll turn it back to you for, for the questions you prepared to, to kick us off. And, and to everybody online, I just wanna um, remind you, don't worry if we didn't get your questions, we'll reach out over email and, and work with the panelists to get them answered. 
um, in that lens of getting in front of investors. Um, how do inventors, particularly small or solo teams, get audiences with VC groups like those on the line? I'll, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the, there's, it's, it's never been easier to figure out how to access someone, I think. Um, and it's just, it's all about trying to figure out what, what your angle is, because I think a lot of investors get so many inbounds, it's hard to prioritize them. And it's really, you know, the, the ones you'll, you'll by definition look at is, the, is you know, the, the ones that get recommended to you by someone you know, or someone um, who, who you've, you know, connected with, or you're a third, you know, third connection to on LinkedIn, whatever it is. I think finding that angle um, is the important one. I mean, make sure it's relevant, make sure you have, you know, a, a pitch deck that's clear and concise, but once you have those and just find a find an angle, um, and that's probably the best way to get someone's attention I've found, um, just in my experience. I don't know, Pete, Ginger, you guys have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of things. Um, know that Hello Tomorrow has a Google Sheet that's public that I posted on LinkedIn a couple of days ago that has the entire Arctic ecosystem, investors and what they invest in and where. Um, so check that out, do your homework. Everyone that's an investor is on social media of some kind or another about what they're doing and don't be afraid of cold email. Uh, I just put my email in the chat, like don't, don't be afraid to do that because um, there's a lot of worry about diversity in the ecosystem and people not having the right connections. And so, you know, lots of, lots of us on the investing side, um, particularly those new in the, and emerging manager types like me are 100% open to cold emails. So. And, you know, I'll add, I mean, we have formed a strategic relationship with M Hub, um, which is why we've been involved in almost everything that they've done. And so, but I'll kind of put it back on M Hub a little bit, and you know, if, if you guys can help us qualify some opportunities, then my staff and I will take a look at that, and we'll do two things. I will certainly um, those that are perfect for investment, we always want, right? But what I will extend is, if you need some coaching for those folks that are thinking about how they bring it to market, we'll make that happen as well. But like, that is one of the things about m hub is it really allows us to leverage their expertise to make sure that we're spending the time at the right level at the right at the right stage so that's kind of my recommendation and why we're so invested in m hub yeah yeah absolutely that that speaks to the last question i was going to ask is when are you considered ready for investment and i i would say you know at m hub we exist to help support and grow startups and make those connections to investors and to build their business models and to scale companies. Sona and the Neopenda team are uh, an MHub member we are very proud of. And so we're here to help that and have just pivoted into helping to close that seed stage gap uh, for hard tech uh, with our product impact fund and accelerator we're looking to launch. So get involved in these communities. If you're not hard tech, 1871 matter. There's a ton of incubators out here um, to really help you build your business. Okay, we're coming right up on the end of our time and I don't want to keep anybody too, too long. So I'm going to toss it back to Pete really quickly before I say our thank yous and goodbyes. Um, Pete, why don't you ask your rapid fire? Well, my rapid fire won't be a rapid fire. It's kind of like a, it was a filler if we didn't have time. So, um, but I'll do a rapid fire right off the top of my head. Um, Let's just wrap it up. I want I'll I'll let you, Ginger, Sona, Beckett, you guys did an outstanding job. Really appreciate the opportunity to moderate the panel. Shannon, I'll I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Well, thank you so much. I echo that I echo that thanks to our panelists today. Thank you to Bank of America for helping to support the original vision of Hub Product Showcase and Demo Day. And while we're not at the Innovation Center with 1,500 people and a great showcase. Uh, and a great party. We'll, we'll be back next year, hopefully, to do this in person. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. If we didn't answer your questions, we will over email. Um, you can catch us at team at mhubchicago.com. And I do wanna put in one more plug. This is the pen ultimate in our summer speaker series. We have another panel next week on the 22nd about industry 4.0 and the upsides and downsides for our regional economy. Um, so 
come join us again. Thank you so much to everybody for joining and I hope everybody has a safe uh, and happy day. Awesome, thanks, thanks so everyone. Much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks.